thank you to Pastor Tim and to Mary Ann and Haley and all who are stepping in and stepping up in different ways today as Katie is out sick, uh, as we learned this morning. And so we thank you to everybody who's worked behind the scenes, uh, particularly in the music ministry today. Stay with me, if you will, in the Gospel of Matthew, in Matthew chapter 3. Uh, we have read the second half of the chapter, but I would ask that you be aware of the first half of it because it really is all one unit. It's all one story, this story of uh, John the Baptizer, John the Baptist, and his ministry of baptism into which steps Jesus to participate in baptism and just to be plain about it, to be baptized. Uh, which sets up all sorts of interesting questions, uh, some of which we'll deal with this morning. But as we look at this wonderful passage from the baptism of Jesus, it is my hope, it is my goal that by the close of our time together today, we together will come away with a deep understanding of the central importance of baptism, not just as baptism relates to this text, not just how baptism has worked historically or how baptism even was observed in yesteryear, but how central is the importance of baptism for the living of our lives in the context of the 21st century. Look with me, if you will, at this passage, and let's recall together a little bit of the history of this wonderful thing known as immersion or uh, Believer's baptism, as you and I sometimes call it. Uh, the practice of baptism is not new. It's not original to the New Testament. In fact, it's quite ancient at the time that Jesus comes along. People had been celebrating baptism or some form of ceremonial cleansing for a long, long time before Jesus came along. In addition to the reality of of, of ceremonial cleansing that was taking place in people's lives and in their worshiping lives uh, in Palestine, going back centuries, but also around Palestine, it's also true that baptism was important in the Jewish faith into which Jesus of Nazareth was born. He would have been familiar with baptism. He would have known of folks who were participating in baptism. If you'll look with me at verse 11, John the Baptist is stepping somewhat into that ancient Jewish tradition of baptism when he steps out into the wilderness and says, y'all come for baptism that, that signifies repentance for the forgiveness of sin. Now, the tradition was probably more something along the lines of we are good Bible-believing or scroll-believing uh, Jewish folk, and, and, and we, as part of our ongoing pilgrimage of faith, are going to participate from time to time in this ritual cleansing here in the synagogue, or here in Jerusalem, or here in the temple, or here at some place like Shiloh, perhaps, that had functioned as a religious center in Jewish life generations earlier. John sort of has one foot in that tradition, but another foot in this new thing that he is doing because he goes out into the wilderness to preach and teach and baptize. Now, you and I think wilderness, and we think uh, hiking the gorge, some, some lush forest uh, on the side of, of a mountain. They think wilderness in the text, and they think desert. They think remote, no trees. Is that... An oasis, is, is that uh, uh, a wadi where there might be uh, a creek with some, some vegetation? Probably not, mostly just desert. And so John the Baptist goes out into this deserted place, this desert, this wilderness, and calls people to him from all of those other civilized places. Because his baptism is not just a statement about an individual awareness of personal sin or even of household commitment. It is an indictment against culture. It is an indictment against society at large. He's saying come away and, and start something wholesale new in, in your life. He's more familiar with perhaps traditions 
uh, that inform our understanding of uh, the architectural or ar archaeological record uh, of uh, baptism. So, for example, many of us are familiar with uh, a place called Qumran. That's the location of the little band of believers uh, that took on a sort of sectarian role. They left uh, Jerusalem behind and went out into the wilderness beyond the Dead Sea and, and in the dirt and in the rock carved out their own little community where they lived in extreme isolation, we think, uh, for generations. They were the people who copied the Hebrew Bible. Uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls is, is their copying work and their work of preservation as they were under attack. But also they developed their own take on Jewish tradition. And so alongside uh, their copying of the Hebrew scripture, they have their own writings uh, about war and apocalypse and, and, and all sorts of things that were unique to their set of concerns. But there in Qumran, not too far from the edge of the Dead Sea, stands a baptismal pool. The people of Qumran, who had stepped away from society to form this little sectarian Jewish community, were participating in immersion as a part of their faith journey. Another example from ancient Palestine is uh, the little, it's too big to be a hillside, but probably not big enough to be a mountainside, uh, called uh, Masada. Masada was well known as uh, a place uh, of Jewish importance even before King Herod decided to build a palace on one side of it. It was fortified and was a place that could be a stronghold for uh, Jewish military and indeed became the last stronghold in about the year 70 when, Ro when Rome had had enough of these uh, every so often uprisings among Jewish folk in Jerusalem and the, and the countryside. And the last of the rebels ran to Masada and, and took refuge where they could defend themselves quite well. And it took Rome months and months and months until finally they just had to haul in dirt and sand and build up a ramp that they could use to siege, lay siege to the fortress on top of Masada. And when finally they breached the walls and came into the fortress up there, they found a couple of different forms of baptismal pools. They found the one that King Herod had constructed to be a part of his beautiful palace that was on one side of Masada, but they also found a baptismal pool that seems to have been constructed by the rebels themselves. Perhaps even as they watched the work below and as they knew that Rome was coming, knew there was no escape, knew they were surrounded and knew there would be few if any prisoners what did they do they baptized as part of their preparation for suffering and perhaps even for martyrdom you're probably familiar with something like this tradition in the early christian years we don't know exactly how long-term or how widespread persecution of Christians would have been in the Roman Empire, but we know that it took place. We know it happened from time to time. And we also know that in certain settings where people anticipated persecution, sometimes they put off baptism. Sometimes they delayed baptism until they could complete a, a, a period of discipleship, a period of spiritual preparation at the end of which they knew Easter was coming. And on Easter, in connection with their observance of the death, of the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus, they went into the waters of baptism as a sign of preparation for their own suffering, their own passion, and perhaps even their own martyrdom leading to the their own resurrection. You see, for a long time, Christians and Jewish folk before them have made a connection between baptism and a preparation for the very different life of faith for those who worship and follow the one true God. Now, Christians have taken it in a couple of different directions as well. In our own Christian tradition of baptism, uh, there are some ways uh, that, that we join in with Jesus in our text today and, and in other ways. 
a couple of images in particular that when we say remember your baptism, we often allude to these images. The first of these is, is cleansing. The original sense of baptism is that there's some sort of ceremonial cleansing. Acts chapter 22, Paul is preaching and teaching. He says this, get up, be baptized, and have your sins washed away, calling upon his name. It's not that this is magic water. It's not that this is water that itself makes us spiritually clean. It's that this act is an illustration of the cleansing that has come within. And it's a visible reminder of that cleansing work that the living and loving God has done and is doing in my life. There's another image that beyond that familiar image of cleansing that is probably tied to every form of baptism, Christians recognized a uniquely Jesus-centric image of baptism. And that's the image of burial. This is why we say when we're in the waters of baptism, a quotation, a reference to Uh, A passage in Romans, another passage in Colossians. And and as we're lowering a baptismal candidate into the water and pausing, not long, just for a split second, I always try to reassure our baptismal candidates, I won't keep you under for long, but unlike that first baptism that I performed where that young lady's makeup never got wet, I'm going to make sure that you go all the way under, and then I'm going to bring you right back up. And as we're going through that process, we say buried with him through baptism into what death and raised to walk in newness of life something new it's this idea that there are some old things dying away and and in a real sense there's an old me that I'm laying to rest because it's not gonna live in me anymore thanks be to God And something new is being born. Again, it's not magic water. But it's this powerful image, and and it's the feeling. uh, Candidates will sometimes talk about feeling that water, ounce by ounce, come over their bodies. Perhaps nothing more could speak to Nicodemus' question in John chapter 3. How can someone be born anew? Can a man enter again into the womb? It's the closest image we have of entering back into the womb, reemerging, reborn into something new. There's also, in addition to these distinctly Christian images, a distinctly Christian meaning. We baptize with an eye toward the forgiveness of sin. We believe that one who has put on Christ, one who has received Jesus as Savior and Lord, has admitted the sinful life of that past self, that there is a transformation that is happening for one who is in love relationship with Jesus. That Jesus is setting us free, is making us new, is making us whole. And so John evokes this idea even as it is still coming together in verse 11. I baptize you with water for repentance. Simon Peter will take up this same idea at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. In the name of the one who can forgive. The one who is able and is holy enough to forgive And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Or the way we put it in uh, in our baptism, when we come over here to the baptistry and we take off this lid and we fill up this font with water, we turn and we greet the entire room. And what do we ask folks to do? What did Pastor Heather just do? Remember your baptism because this each and every time one comes to it is a reminder an observance a celebration for each and every one this is a church that's 210 years old this year and so there's a rich history of baptism settle in with me for just a moment I want to ask you to take a look at the screen and let's remember together one of the old ways that we used to baptize and one of the stories that shapes who we are 
as GBC in our baptism tradition. We're over here on Jefferson Street. This is the original GBC property from a couple hundred years ago after we left when we were meeting at the courthouse. I want you to see this facility. This was never our building, though this was the GBC property. When our congregation left this location and, and came over to the current location, this was a property that was deeded then to the African American population, many of them slaves or a few perhaps uh, freed persons. I want you to see this location because it was from here that we would have conducted our original uh, baptisms. We would have gone just down Jefferson Street here, just behind us, is Royal Spring as it flows out to meet Elkhorn Creek. One of the things that's been lost today in our culture is some sense of the complexity of baptism for years gone by. Back in these days, in the life of our church, we would have walked down and gone straight to the water's edge, many of us singing, walking right behind those who were robed, preparing to go into the water. And there was a sense of holiness about that journey. We talk today about remembering your baptism but early generations of GBC folks would have remembered that walk and the entire congregation walking with them down to the water's edge, singing songs, praying over them, rejoicing, and coming back up to here at our original physical place. So here we are at the creek, and part of that memory, of course, is coming down here for baptism. I want to share with you a very special story from our history and from Baptist history in Kentucky. And it's the story of a man named George Washington Dupee. George Washington Dupee was born in Gallatin County in the 1820s as a child to parents who were slaves. Growing up in Kentucky in Woodford County and Franklin County, uh, he was, of course, a part of an estate of a landowner named Lewis Craig. You may remember his name, and that's a story for another time. As a slave, the legend is that Dupee was led to Christ in Versailles, downtown Versailles, by one of the ministers there, and soon thereafter felt called to minister. He ended up living here in Scott County and became a part of our church in the 1840s. In about 1851, our church ordained him to the gospel ministry. Preachers at his ordination service included the pastor of Georgetown Baptist Church at the time, as well as the then president of Georgetown College. Uh, he served uh, this congregation in Georgetown, the African American congregation, for several years, and sometime in that span, he also started serving historic Pleasant Green Baptist Church in downtown Lexington. If that rings a bell, but you're not sure where to place it, Pleasant Green is the church that keeps watch over Rupp Arena from across the large single-level parking lot there. But he was serving both congregations at the time. Uh, he eventually, a couple years after that arrangement, moved down to Paducah and became the influential pastor of what became the mother church for all sorts of African-American congregations across the state. Started the first Black Baptist Local Association, started the, uh, the first statewide uh, Baptist body among African Americans that still exists to this day, started publishing the first Black Baptist newspaper in the state, and even helped purchase and lead toward the creation of Simmons College in Louisville, which is now connected with our own Baptist Seminary of Kentucky. The story of Dupee is a special one. But here in Georgetown, his story is remembered in a different way. There's a local legend here that takes pieces of his life and puts them together in a little bit different way. You see, right in the middle of all that, as he was serving the two congregations, history tells us that he was a part of that estate of Lewis Craig when it closed, when it was finalized. And that the rights to him as a slave, it's hard for us even to think in those terms today, but the rights to him as part of that estate were to be auctioned off on the steps of our courthouse. Members of Pleasant Green Baptist Church in downtown Lexington approached the pastor of First Baptist Church, the Anglo congregation there, 
and asked for help purchasing the freedom of their pastor. Members of First Baptist, including the pastor, did help, and for years after that, Pleasant Green and, and Pastor Dupee were repaying uh, to, to pay off for his freedom. The way that's remembered locally here in local legend is that it wasn't after his ordination, it was in his baptism. The way it's remembered here locally is that as he came up out of the waters of baptism, he was seized and taken to Lexington to the Cheapside slave auction where he was to be sold off down river to Louisiana or Mississippi or someplace. We can understand why it was remembered that way. Because for persons who were born into slavery, and, and decades, even generations later, children of slaves, and those much later in life who knew former slaves and children of slaves would have associated being in a place like a public baptism as a dangerous sort of thing because someone might show up and lay, came, lay claim to your freedom. And it's remembered that sense of fear and that sense of deep commitment that was connected to baptism for generations past. Now that we remember a little bit of that hurt, a little bit of that fear, that anxiety that candidates would have carried with them as they approached the waters of baptism, perhaps now we can go back and try to answer that question, why would Jesus be baptized? The answer, uh, of course, is, is not that he requires cleansing. The answer, of course, is, is not that uh, he needs these images of burial and resurrection. He will be his own image of burial and resurrection. And, and there are no sins uh, requiring forgiveness in his life. And, and yet, within Jesus at this time of baptism, there is a transformation that is happening. There is a transformation that is coming into God's very creation within Christ Jesus at his time of baptism and beyond. Yesterday I swung by my dad's house and we got in the car together and drove down to Campbellsville to attend the funeral of one of his best friends, someone he met during his uh, first year of seminary in Louisville. Uh, Bob Doty uh, taught English at Campbellsville University for a long, long time. He was filling in here on sabbatical for our own Gwen and Ralph Curry as they were away at Oxford in 1986 when my family moved to town. And when he heard that his old buddy from seminary was here, he said, I know you're looking for a house. I have plenty of room uh, rattling around in this old house on Hollyhock, which eventually became Megan's office, but that's another story. Uh, Y'all come and stay with me. And so we lived with Bob for about a month. At the funeral yesterday, I was not surprised to hear talk of all of his ministry uh, to local churches and all of his, the impact of his life on college students. I was not surprised that there were people who had flown back in, a professor from NC State, a professor from Yale who had come in to honor uh, their mentor. I wasn't surprised to see Boy Scouts in uniform at the funeral for he had been a lifelong scout. Uh, I wasn't surprised to hear other people talking about his hospitality because he let us live there, he taught me how to fish, we waded the Elkhorn together, and so on and so forth. But I was surprised to hear about his childhood. I was surprised to hear about the loneliness and the hurt that not once, not twice, but three different times in his formative years, he came home to discover that his family was gone that they had been evicted, or that his items were sitting out on the porch from his first apartment, which had been rented out to someone else. And the rest of his life, he never had a sense of home. It was read in his memoir, and I've not read his autobiography, that he estimated that during his formative years, particularly after the death of his father, not one time in his upbringing did he have a one-on-one -on -one positive interaction with an adult? Think about what that does to a person. 
And think about the likelihood that he would have gone a completely different direction and the unlikelihood that he went the direction that he did. That's the type, the type of difference that Christ makes in a person's life. Why would Jesus be baptized? Because every one of us needs to hear someone say, I'm with you. You're not alone. As isolated as you may feel, I'm with you. It's what Jesus says to John the Baptist in verse 11. When, when John refers to one who is more powerful who will come after me, Jesus steps forward. In verse 15, Jesus himself says, let it be so now. Let the one who is to come step forward now in an affirmation of this bold declaration of John. I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you in this ministry for the repentance of sins. I'm with you in this crazy sectarian uh, indictment of society at large. I'm with you in this attempt to give people hope that transcends this mundane life. I'm with you, John. So declares Jesus as he steps forward. I'm with you. So says God the Creator, and so says God the Spirit. When Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, steps out to participate in baptism. The verses 16 and 17 read this way, And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. I'm with you. So say the other persons of the triune God in this perfect unity, this perfect selflessness, this perfect affirmation of the holy expressions of God throughout history. As you enter this world that is addicted to itself, I'm with you. As you enter this world that is addicted to violence, I'm with you. As you enter this world that is addicted to every way but the holy way of God, I'm with you. As a forgotten and forsaken creator, I'm with you. As the spirit of which God's people do not yet fully know Joel's prophetic declaration of a spirit that will be poured out on all flesh, I'm, I'm with you. As you try to teach them and they oppose you, I'm with you. As you try to invite them and they reject you, I'm with you. As, they try, as you try to bless them and they revile you, I'm with you. As you try to disciple them and they abandon you, I'm with you. Even when they kill you, I'm with you. So declares the triune God. And Jesus speaks this word to those along the shoreline and in the water, those onlookers who have left behind Jerusalem and little towns all across Judea and beyond to come out and observe. Verse 5 tells us they've come from all over the place to listen and bear witness to what John is doing. And Jesus says to them, I'm with you. Uh, in all the highways and byways of life, I'm with you. In all the places where you're trying to make sense of this world, I'm with you. In all the places where what you've read and come to believe about the Hebrew Scripture does not match up with the nasty existence of your day-to-day -day life, I'm with you. As you try to raise your children, I'm with you. As you try to take care of others, I'm with you. As you try to be honest in the marketplace, I'm with you. And as you try to think of what is transcendent in this life, I, the Holy One of Israel, I'm with you. God is not the only one speaking. Jesus is not the only one speaking at this baptism. There are others here who speak as well. Because many of those onlookers left behind whatever they had brought with them to the water's edge, literally, figuratively, they left behind and they stepped down off the shore themselves into the water. And in so doing, they said, those candidates said to Jesus, and to some sense to John, we're with you too. Wherever you lead, 
I'm with you. Whatever miracles you perform, I'm with you. Whatever miracles you refuse to perform, I'm with you. Whatever teachings you lay before us, those that are familiar and those that are new, I'm with you. Whatever you ask of me, whatever you ask of our household, whatever you expect us to do in your goodness, in your holiness, in this fresh manifestation of the very holiness of God, I'm with you, they say. As the water comes up above their ankles and to the knees and to the waist, If it is as it may have been at Royal Spring that they lean forward to be immersed. If it is as we do in these waters that they're laid back to be immersed. As the water washes over them verbally and non-verbally but within their very being they say. I'm with you God. I'm with you Jesus. Wherever he leads I'll go. In conclusion today. If you are looking for a way to mark the great transformation that God is bringing, the difference that Jesus has made in your life, think of baptism. As God says, I am for Jesus, I'm with you. As Jesus is for me, as I am for Jesus, and as I am for this band of believers with whom I share this baptized life, with you and there's no better clearer way to say it than in the waters of baptism there is a transformation happening in here that is symbolized by this outward symbol out there for I want all the world to know the difference that Jesus has made for me this morning if you recognize that what stands between you and baptism is a decision for Christ and you're ready to receive him today, uh, confessing your sin and receiving forgiveness of sin. If you're ready to repent and leave that old life behind, if you're ready to die to that past self and be born anew, then receive him as Savior and Lord. Others may recognize that you have made that decision but have never declared it publicly. You have never joined in this, this symbol, this ordinance known as baptism. You have never walked into those waters and declared Uh, verbally and non-verbally, the difference that Jesus has made for you. And today is the day that you want to make that step forward just as Jesus did. Perhaps you're ready to enter the waters of believer's baptism. Still others may recognize that you are desperately needing to join as those on the water's edge did years ago with the onlookers who had come from Jerusalem and beyond to observe John the Baptist and Jesus. You too need to leave behind the water's edge and join in that band of believers, this band of believers known as sisters and brothers in Christ at GBC. It would be our joy and privilege to receive you into the worshiping and serving and fellowshipping life of this congregation and still others may be recognizing that what is needed for you is a moment or a season of prayer or reflection something that is calling you home but a leading that is not yet fully fleshed out within your life and you need some discipling accountability conversation in your life however it is that you need to respond to the one who walks into the water for believers baptism to say boldly to each and every one I'm with you however you need to respond And as our musicians lead us, then won't you come? As we sing this song, let let these words be your declaration. And if there's more that's on your heart that needs to be dealt with today, if you are needing to respond today to the work of the Holy One moving in your life, come and share. We stand.